I come from an era, my first fight at the WC, I would run to the bank to deposit the check so it wouldn't bounce. Like that's how long I've been fighting. Fighting in Tijuana, Mexico, I mean, the sport now, where we were just at Madison Square Garden, breaking every record that Madison Square Garden has ever had to where we began is just something that I can barely fathom, having been in it for so long. When I, when I look back, I think more of anything, I would have hoped that with this level of shocking success that we achieved where we are now, this extraordinary profit generated you know, by the fighters, my brothers and sisters who bleed and sweat every single day in the octagon, in the gym, with their coaches. You know, it's, it's not just what you see in the octagon, it's what we put every single day, every single night. As I'm cutting weight right now, already trained this morning at Wild Card Gym, got to eat a little bit of chicken, gonna train as soon as we get off this call for a fight that's gonna be happening in 12 days. Like th this is the life that we've signed up for. If you would have told me that this level of, of a success would have happened, I would have thought that it would have been shaped a little bit differently. You know, we're the ones that pack the stadiums. We're the ones that drive the incredible pay-per-view buy rates. You know, the, the guys that are seated right, seated right now around me, the ones that have bled in the octagon, that have taken last-minute fights, day before even changes, guys like myself trying to fight for a different opponent, that we're responsible for the hundreds and mil millions of dollars in sponsorships worldwide that we would have been given a fair share. We would have seen an ironclad protection put in place to ensure that when things got bad, would be protected. When we get hurt, when we retire, when, when we're damaged, that there'd be something there, a safety net, and it's not there. You know, we, we have a saying in the military, uh, everybody heard, you know, right. Movies, it's been glamorized, it's in books. You know, we have no man left behind. That's, that, that's kind of meaningless to maybe a lot of people. It's not to me. Not, not to a guy that climbed mountains in Afghanistan to try to recover bodies of dead friends. So no man left behind resonates with me permanently. You know, I would have assumed that if the UFC reached the incredible level, level of success that they have, that the fighters wouldn't have been left behind. You, know, you wouldn't have guys that are near not starving but can barely walk and there's nothing that can be done for them you know that's why we're here today that's why we have george kane tj cowboy Bjorn. that's that's why we're here we're, we're here to never left somebody to leave somebody behind we're here to take every step necessary to make sure that no athletic no no athlete no fight on the ufc gets left behind that one-sided system that the ufc has in place and, and has had for many years and now under new ownership intends to keep in place that it will get changed and changed immediately. You, you know already that MMA is a tough sport. Like football, short and long term, being a pro MMA fighter does not paint a very pretty picture for your future. We're warriors. This is what we know and this is what we want to do. This is our dream. I dream of being a UFC middleweight champion. Now, this is who we are and what we do. We love this sport and we love competing in it. We readily have accepted the risks. But with the way the one-sided system is set up, the vast majority of the UFC fighters end up completely forgotten, disregarded, with nothing to show for their battles. What we're doing today isn't about me, it isn't about Kane, it isn't about Cowboy, it's about the yesterday and the today's fighters. Those that are going to end up with nothing. No savings, no insurance, no pension, no safety net of any kind. The only thing most can be sure of is that they're going to have a lifetime of dealing with the results of having fought in the octagon. Their hands, their knees, their hips, their shoulders, most importantly, their brains. In the coming months, we're going to introduce you to some of those disregard, disregarded and forgotten fighters. I mean, you know them. You know their names. You don't know their stories. Intentionally. I, I mean, that's almost by design, that you haven't heard the story. So you truly understand how incredibly important what we're doing is. And what's at stake here? You fight, and to win, you have to have a great team. You know, I, I come from Jackson MMA. I have Cowboy, a teammate, sitting right across from me. You know, I'm now in the probably longest fight camp in UFC history. I could not be ready for my fight now at UFC 206 without my team. That's what we have here. We are surrounded by world champions, some of the most recognizable faces in the UFC, 
and a man that knows the MMA business. We have the expertise and the experience to help achieve our goals. Not here with us today is an incredible, with us today is a legal team that has the most accomplished attorney in the history of Athlete Association's legal matters, Jim Quinn. And we have a great organizational team of MMA fighters who know the sport and its athletes. We have an elite PR team and a support staff that is second to none. The, the people that are at this table, they were handpicked and chosen, not only because they're marquee, recognizable names, heavyweight champions, featherweight champions, what should be welterweight champions, you know, the most winningest fighter in UFC history and Canadian superstar. It's guys that have the knowledge and experience and desire to see the sport that they love and have bled for get better. So I'm proud to announce the official launch of the Mixed Martial Arts Athletes Association. It's going to be big, and we are changing the face of this sport forever starting today. Next is George. Everybody knows George St. Pierre. Um, you know, the no introductions necessary, and he, he has some, some words to say. Thank you. Hi, guys. Thank you, everybody, to be here. And, um, yeah, so if we're all here today to talk about a, a problem, um, it's a problem, uh, like everywhere in life, um, we wanted to make it, the situation better for everybody. People know I've been in UFC for more than 10 years. Um, I've been traveling, uh, I'm from Canada, I've been traveling for my training, camp to camp. I've been in USA, many other countries to train. And everywhere I've trained, I've, you know, when you train with people, there's some kind of camaraderie that, that, that happens with you and your training partner. And you start to discuss and things get personal. You start to learn more about their situation. Their situation that are common to everyone and opinions that are common to all the guys that I've trained with. If I'm here today, it's to talk about this pro these problems, all right? And also uh, to make the situation better. Like I did in the past, maybe through, for the UFC, I, be, I will be seen as a villain right now. Like I, like I was when I came out for the performance and anything drug problem. But the bottom line is now the situation has been rectified. And if I come here talking about these problems that we have now, it's because I want the situation to be rectified and I want everybody to be happy on both sides. I'm a, one of the rare fighters that came out and who's healthy and wealthy nowadays. I can't say that about most of the, most of the guys. If I didn't fight yet, it's because the situation wasn't fair for me. Most of the sport, it's 50-50, promoter, athlete. For us, we have around 8%. So when I talk about it's not fair for me, it's not only fair for me, it's not fair to the US, up to the, US, to, to the UFC top contestant, even to Conor McGregor, who doesn't have his fair share of what he should have. I'm not born with a silver spoon. People forget it sometimes because I have a lot of my, I'm doing very well now, but I'm not born with a silver spoon. It has been, a, I know I'm a real fighter. It has been a time that I worked three jobs, went to school, and trained for a fight. I remember my first fight, I did 3,000 plus 3,000 in the UFC. So I didn't, if I reached the, the position that I am now, I didn't stole it from nobody. I worked very hard for it. So traveling during my, my career, gym to gym, training with different training partners from different country, different culture, same pattern during the, when we, we discuss the discussion and the problems that we have in, 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 in our work, our fill of work, same problems always been mentioned. And if I'm here today, if we're here today is to stay, to take a stand and also fight 
for all the fighters who have those same problems. Fighters who got bullied and intimidated. Fighters who are afraid to retire or get fired, left broken with brain injury, physical trauma, with no assurance and care. Fighters that I personally met before their, in the beginning of their career, were not even the same person at the end of their career. I'm not talking about trauma and memory problems, I'm talking about personality issues. They're not the same person that they are. And these guys, they have families. And most of the time, they, it, 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 it creates a lot of problems because you're not the same person. So they have no care, nothing that, to help them. And this, for me, is unacceptable. Things have to change. I know I'm not the only one that, that has that opinion because, I, like I said, I've been traveling a lot. If I'm with the team I'm with today, it's because of all the people that have approached me for the same situation. I feel this team is the most solid by far of all of it. Don't forget that UFC without fighters, it's only three letters of the alphabet. So I think that it's time for us to, to make our voice here and make, make change happening for the best of, all the, of, of the UFC, but also for, for the, the fighters. Cowboy. Cowboy. Uh, Cowboy here. I uh, didn't write a speech like I wish I had because now I'm kind of sitting here and not know what to say. So I'm just going to speak, I guess, from the heart of how I feel. <clears throat> Years ago, you asked me to speak up. I, I probably wouldn't have because I'd be in fear that UFC would maybe bench me or, 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 or fire me. And I think that's, a, that's a, a big fear in a lot of the fighters out there. So I'm glad to sit here with, the, with these solid guys, the champions, and the people who have been in the sport for a long time. So I feel good to, to speak up and say, but... You know, the financial side of it, that's one, one avenue you guys talking about, but just the health care and the, and, and the pension and the what do we do next and the, and the what do we even do right now, that, that's the part to me that, that I think needs to be heard. And, and our medicals, like, you know, we get X amount of dollars to fight, but then you see there's $10,000 of medicals taken out of all of our, all of our things. You know, I think that's something that we should address and, and you know, pension and, and surgeries and people getting hurt. And there's just so many things that I... I want answers to, and, and I want I want to see, and so that's why I'm, I'm here today with you guys to, to ask you guys as many questions along with the with the board and and the and all the questions to be asked. So I'm here to learn as well because I don't know what the fuck I'm getting myself into, and I'm I'm here hopefully standing for the 500 fighters UFC saying, you know what, fucking Cali, we'll stand with you and we'll make this happen. So uh, yeah, that's really about all I got. <laughs> <clears throat> I'm TJ Dillashaw, and I'm here just to speak about what's right. You know what what needs to be done. Um, you know, this sport's full of the highest highs and the lowest lows, and I think the lowest low is not losing. It's seeing these past UFC fighters that have nothing to show for, that have been cut, that have retired, and, you know, I mean, I've seen multiple, many, many, many fighters have, have nothing to show for it, are banged up, um, not only from brain trauma, just just from just from the, the, the abuse we've taken, you know, and uh, I'm with Cowboy with, with this whole health insurance and pensions and retirement plans, and It'd be nice to, to have a plan after I'm done fighting, you know, not to have to to struggle and ha know how to take care of my family. Um, you know, I got to pay for health or ins health insurance right now myself, and uh, training training is the toughest part of this uh, this sport. You know, you don't you don't get hurt in your fights always; you get hurt in training. There's so many hours I put into the gym, so much sweat, blood, and tears that I put in and, and get injured all the time that I got to go and pay for and. Uh, I'm not in a sport where I'm sitting behind a desk, or I'm not in a job where I'm sitting behind a desk and uh, taking care of business. I'm out there putting my life on the line, and uh, it'd just be nice to have some, some reap some reward from it. You know, to to hear that we only get paid eight percent of what the UFC brings in is just crazy to me. You know, you, you see these other sports that you know they're bringing in fifty percent of what the sport brings in, and uh, you know are treated treated right. They got health insurance, they have pensions, they have retirement plans. Um, I'm just here standing up for what's right and want to be taken care of, you know, and not only for the, the past, the, you know, the past fighters, the current fighters, and to pave the, pave the future for the, the fighters to come. 
you know, I think it's a real important thing, and I'm excited to be a part of this association, and uh, I'm sitting with a good group of guys, and this is really exciting stuff. And I'm going to pass it off to big man Kane Velasquez right here. Hey, guys, thanks for everybody for uh, being on this call with us. Um, I wanted to talk about something that I know far too well. Um, my first fight in the UFC was in 2008. Since that time, I've had seven surgeries. That's two meniscus surgeries, one MCL surgery on my right knee, um, taking cartilage out of my left elbow. Um, both shoulders, I've had torn labrums that needed uh, repairing and back surgery. Um, I have a fight December 30th. After that fight, I'm already scheduled for my next surgery. And it's not just me. It's other UFC fighters that are going through the same thing that have gone through the same thing. And um, for us in the future, there is no post-retirement health plan. Um, that's why I think it's important for what we're doing now, us fighters coming together and having the rest of the UFC roster the fighters come together to make our lives, our lives better now and in the future. Thanks, Kane. Hey, this is Bjorn Redney. It's good to talk to everyone again. It's, it's been a while. Uh, the truth here is simple, and it's straightforward, and it's backed up by number after number. And those numbers paint a crystal clear picture of what's really going on here and what's been going on for over a decade. I'm more than happy to provide those numbers. In fact, I look forward to it. But when I do, Remember, the numbers are the evidence of the wrongs, evidence that confirms the outrageous, completely one-sided way the UFC has treated its athletes. The outrageous conduct is the William Morris Endeavor IMG UFC conglomerate compelling courageous, elite, pro-level athletes to risk everything and paying them a tiny fraction of what's fair while providing them with no short or long-term protection or safety net of any kind. Given who's on the call, the 100 plus media members, I think it's pretty safe to assume that we're all MMA fans. So let's be honest and let's stop the double speak. MMA is an incredibly dangerous sport. The short and long term consequences of being a pro mixed martial artist are often frightening. And as I've said many times in the past, I'm a huge MMA fan. I have been for decades. I think it's the greatest sport on earth, the most intense, exciting combination of speed agility, aggression, and courage that we've ever seen in sports history. And I'll be the first person to defend mixed martial arts athletes' rights to make their living in this sport, to knowingly assume that risk, just like I believe pro football players should be able to play pro football knowing full well what those long-term consequences may be. But when the group that totally controls every aspect of mixed martial arts of this industry is making money hand over fist, hundreds of millions of dollars in profits year after year after year, producing higher margins than any professional sport in history, when it's actually proven that they're the most valuable sports property ever, yes, in the history of sports, and when the athletes who put them there, the athletes responsible for the over $4 billion purchase price, the athletes who drive those 50% margins, 50% margins on $600 million in annual revenue. When the WME IMG UFC conglomerate asks those athletes to risk everything, to put their lives, their futures on the line, just pure human decency requires that they're paid fairly and that they're protected long term. Like I said, I'll provide the backup, the numbers, the specifics still on blue in the face, but the point here that matters most is that these athletes are risking more for less than any professional athletes on earth. They've got no protection, no pension, no safety net of any kind, and they're paid pennies on the dollar, a tiny fraction of what's fair. And those aren't assumptions, those are facts. The structure the UFC's employed for over a decade and the WME IMG's adopted and perpetuated is outrageous and unfair to the very athletes responsible for driving the UFC's business. And that's what we're going to change. Okay, thank you, Bjorn, and thank you to the fighters. Um, we're going to open up the lines for questions now. Um, I'm going to toss it back to Elise, who can explain how you can get your question in the queue, and then we'll start taking them one by one. So, Elise.
Steve. Certainly at this time, if you would like to ask a question, please press star then one on your touchtone phone. You may withdraw yourself from the question queue by pressing the pound key. Once again, star then one if you have a question. We'll pause just a moment to allow questions to queue. Our first question comes from Mark Ramondi with SB Nation. Please go ahead. Hi, guys. Uh, thanks for the call. Uh, I guess uh, first for Bjorn, um, what role is uh, CAA and uh, Mike Fonseca playing in this association, if any at all? Yeah, that, I, thanks for the question. Let me, uh, let me try to clear that up uh, to make it crystal clear to everybody on the call, because I've seen a lot of the Oliver Stone-esque theories that have popped up online. CAA is not backing this venture. But let's be super clear. They're supportive of the athletes because that's what real agencies are supposed to do. By definition, talent agencies like WMEIMG are supposed to scratch and claw 24-7, 365 to make the entertainers and athletes they represent more money, a bigger piece of the pie. They're agents. That's what their job is. So here's what, ha what happened, or here's what should have happened but didn't. When WMEIMG acquired the UFC, what they should have done is they should have taken 500 plus fighters, they should have put them on first class flights, they should have put them in a gorgeous hotel and brought them to a spectacular meeting. And they should have sat down with those fighters and they should have said, you have our deepest, most sincere apologies for the egregious, outrageous way you've been treated over the years. And we're going to fix all that. We're going to remedy it. We're going to pay you what you are due. We are going to provide for you the kind of benefits and the kind of protection and safety net and pension that guys who put their lives on the line for an entertainment vehicle that we own deserve. But they didn't do any of that. Their public statements painted a crystal clear, ugly picture of what their plan is. And I quote, this will be business as usual. We're not changing anything. In fact, the only step they've taken so far was to make cutbacks to help make them even more money. In fight speak, basically, they sucker punched the fighters in the face and made more money for WMEIMG. And, and, and let me take it one step further. Ari Emanuel, who heads WMEIMG, assured investors, his investors in writing, that prior to any increases in how much they'd make from TV or pay-per-view or ticket sales or sponsorship or closed circuit or any other revenue streams, that they would achieve a 50% EBITDA margin. That's what they put in writing. And you know how they say they're going to get there? They say they're going to get there by reducing expenses. Reducing expenses to achieve a 50% margin on $600 million in annual revenues. Now, one more insult to injury, and I know you asked a small question, but I want to give you a long answer. <laughs> in addition to the 50% margin on $600 million in revenues annually, WMEIMG, and I swear this is true, is paying themselves an additional $25 million per year in a, in quotes, management fee. I couldn't make that level of greed up. So when you ask me the question, no, this isn't being backed by CAA, but they're supporting their fighters just like they support their athletes and their entertainers in anything and everything they do. But they didn't pay any money. They're not the financial backer. And Mike Fonseca is the agent to a lot of these guys. So I, I talked to him, absolutely I've talked to him. An agent's agent who stepped up on behalf of his athletes and is supporting them in what they're sitting here with me trying to accomplish. And, uh, and just one more for, for Bjorn, thank you for that. Uh, there's already been a little bit of criticism. I've seen some MMA managers express concern when they saw your name um, associated with this, uh, someone who's a former promoter and someone who's been criticized in the past for, for fighter treatment. Can you respond to that criticism? Yeah. Um, Look, I think the easiest way for me to respond to it without going into a great deal of depth is that the most successful year I ever had as a promoter, I paid the athletes who fought for me 53% of our revenues. So if the UFC and Ari Emanuel and WMEIMG would like to step up and equal 53%, I'm pretty confident that we'll all be able to get this thing settled within a matter of weeks. Thank you, guys. Hey, Mark, are you still on there? I am. It is Tim Kennedy. Um, hey, Tim. Mike is my agent, and it's not like he came to me. 
you know where I stand, you know where Cowboy stands, you know where Kane stands, you know where TJ stands, you know where George stands. This isn't like a new thing. We have been looking for the best horse to get behind on the race. No horse is perfect, right? Like, some get tired. Some is built for the 500. But this is the best horse that we've had, and that's why I'm here. There's nobody from CAA in this room right now. The people that are here are the fighters that 100% believe that there needs to be change. This isn't, this isn't a conspiracy theorist dream of two competing organizations. This is a bunch of dudes that have been the sport since the beginning that know right now something has to fucking change. It has nothing to do with anything else besides the fighters. Okay, thanks. Thank you guys. Let's go on to the next question, um, Elise. We'll go next to Brett Okamoto with ESPN. Please go ahead. Hey, thank you, guys. Just one thing to follow up on what Mark just asked, Bjorn. Should we assume then that you are no longer going to be, uh, you're forever kind of stepping aside as, as a promoter, or is is that something that we shouldn't necessarily jump to the conclusion right away, given your association with this? This is my focus, Brett. This is this is what I'm focused on. We've been working on this for over two years. Some really great people who I've got enormous respect for stepped up a couple years ago and brought this uh, this venture to my attention. I don't even know if venture is the right terminology to use, but brought this to my attention and said, this is important, let's do it. And of course, given the years I've spent in this industry and you know, cutting a lot of international television deals and domestic TV deals and having done pay-per-view and done event after event after event, I understood the drivers, I understood the revenues and the expenses. So, but probably more importantly than that is um, MMA has been pretty good to me. And, you know, it's not often you get an opportunity to step up and do something um, that's right and that actually matters and is going to have some significance moving forward. So this is the, this is the focus. And I'm going to be in this as long as these guys that sit on this board want me in it, and when they don't want me in it anymore, they're going to tell me and I'll leave. And then uh, thank you, Bjorn, and, and for the fighters there, whoever wants to answer this, you know, you know Donald, uh, the cowboy, he spoke about having fear previously in recent years. He may have not have stepped up and said this. Is there fear now? Like how, much, how much of a risk do you guys think you're taking in publicly aligning yourself with something like this? Yeah, absolutely. I feel there's still fear, you know, but it needs to be done. And I think standing with the five guys here, we're big names, man, and we just need to get the rest of the guys to not have the fear to stand up with us, you know, and, uh, so yeah, we're putting ourselves out there, and uh, what's going to happen? I have no fucking idea, but uh, I'm here, and God damn it, let's run until the wheels fall off. <laughs> okay, great. Thanks, Brett. We're going to move on to the next question. Elise? We'll go Brett. next to Brett. Brett. Oh, wait. One second. George would like to say something really quickly. Brett. Now, another thing I have to say. We talk about fear. To make a fight right now, every time, I, every time we go fight, we're afraid. But this is a this is a different kind of fight, and I think even though I know a lot of fighters are afraid, because of my situation now, I'm in much better place than I was a few years ago. But I know a lot of fighters are afraid. But it's time, even though you're afraid, it's time to step up and do the right thing. If everybody do the right thing, it's we, we're all afraid, but it's fine to join in and, and do the right thing. It's a fight. It's like a fight in the octagon, but it's a fight against what is right and what is wrong. And we should never be afraid to stand for the virtues, stand for what is right. Yeah, I mean, this is TJ here, and I, I would lie saying that I wasn't nervous. You know, I feel like I have the pre-fight jitters coming here, you know, but just like George said, man, it, it, it pumps me up him, him saying is that we're here because it's right, you know, it's, it's what needs to be done, and uh, ultimately I'm going to feel good about doing it no matter what happens, you know, but you know, I am nervous. Okay, great. Thank you, guys. Uh, we'll move on to the next question, Elise. Certainly. We'll go next to Lance Pugmire with the Los Angeles Times. Please go ahead. Okay, great. Thank you, guys. Uh, I guess, Bjorn, you can answer this, and I don't know if you addressed this early in the call. I wasn't on it, I apologize, but um, there's been some skepticism that maybe, you know, what this is all about is a, is a class action lawsuit that is basically, you know, it's going to be a temporary money grab, but it's not going to truly allow the, the fighters to, to get back, all of the fighters, what they, what they need is really a good deal, 
you know, throughout the term. Can you comment on that? Is is that is a class action lawsuit part of your uh, plan? No, look, it's a that's a great question. It's a big open-ended question. You and I could go around in circles on that for about an hour and a half. But but let me try to simplify it. Let me try to break it down to its most basic points. Um, there. There is a class action lawsuit that was filed a couple of years ago, but here's, here's the reality. Why would you want to give away 33% of what you're going to get to attorneys from Chicago and San Francisco and Philadelphia who don't know anything about MMA, have never worked in our industry, um, when you can win this without going that route? It's better to get 100% of something than it is to get 66% of something because you're defaulting into handing it off to somebody who's not part of our industry to litigate. Could a litigation be the end result at some point? Yes, it could. But the essence of the fight is fight like wild dogs up front. And let's win this before we go there so that 100% of what comes out of this can go to the fighters. And the answer to the question of what comes out of this, no, it, it is, this structure is by no means a money grab. There are three aspects to what we're going to ultimately achieve. Number one, we're going to get a very substantial settlement, an enormous settlement that's going to compensate prior UFC fighters and current UFC fighters for the egregious, outrageous conduct that they've been subject to over the last decade plus. Number two, we're going to take eight cents on the dollar and we're going to drive it to 50 cents on the dollar. And number three, we're going to negotiate a CBA that includes a benefits package that's commensurate and comparable to what Major League Baseball players have, and NFL players have, and NBA players have, and NHL players have. I've got people sitting with me here in the room who are working with us who play in Major League Baseball. J.P. Aaron CB is sitting right with us, and he's working with us. And he's been in the majors four years, and he's got a pension already that exceeds the average comp that UFC fighters today that are fighting in the octagon receive. So the essence of what we're going to ultimately achieve, the essence of what the association is going to achieve for the athletes and the guys sitting here with me is it's a settlement to address the past wrongs. It's driving the comp level up to 50% from a current 8%, and it's about a benefits package that provides a safety net and some semblance of security for these guys. And I have a very high confidence level based on the strategies and the people and the team we got on board. We're going to be able to accomplish that prior to filing suit so that we don't have to give away 33% of what otherwise should go to Kane and to Cowboy, to George, to hundreds of fighters that are listening um, and that are part of the UFC right now, and to a lot of guys who are, like Tim said, and like TJ said, that are suffering the ravages of having fought in the octagon. A lot of these guys are going to walk out of having fought for the UFC multiple times, 10, 12, 15, even more, and the only thing they're going to have is the results of having fought in the octagon. And that's just, that's simply unacceptable. Okay, great. Thank you so much for your time. Okay, thanks, Lance. We'll go to the next question. So next to TJ DeSantis with StoreDog.com. Please go ahead. Hey, guys. It's Ian McCall with Storytime with Uncle Creepy and TJ DeSantis. Um, as a fighter myself, uh, I want to know what, what is your plan to get fighters like myself uh, who are under contract with the, U- with the UFC on board? Hey, Ian, it's Tim. I think we're going to be talking later tonight. How yes, are you? Are. Good. How are you, buddy? I miss you. <laughs> um, we can talk more about this uh, then, if you want, as well. Hey, so this is the beginning. Th- th- we are empowering. This is every single fighter that is listening to this, every single fighter that is going to read, every single article that's going to be written about this from the hundred some odd journalists that are on this call, contact us. We have four of the five biggest gyms on the planet represented here at this table right now. Well, that's happenstance. You know, we have Alpha Male, um, we have Colorado, we have AK, we have Jacksons, we have TriStar. You know, we we need ATT here as well. But like, we know the guys at the biggest, most successful, prolific gyms in the sport, and if you're going to get nothing but straight, honest truths from the people that are sitting at this table. If you walk up to Kane and you ask him. What should I do? You're a young UFC fighter. If you walk up to George, somebody walks up to TJ, if somebody walks up to Cowboy, somebody walks up to me, you're going to get the truth from us because that's, that's the only thing that we know how to say. We know it's right. And what has happened so far has not been right. So I'm not recruiting, Ian. That's not what I'm saying. Do you want to see change? Do you want to make 8% or do you want to see there to be something different for your future? For fighters that have already fought and that are hurt, they can barely walk, you want to see them be able to get surgeries that they badly need? You know, do you want to see these young kids 
that are making, what, eight and eight have a chance to be able to put food on their table, I don't need to convince them this is the right thing. Come to us. Come talk to us. You are now empowered. This is the best team that there could exist to make this come to fruition. So I'm not going to – we're going to talk – yes, we're going to come and we're going to talk to people. But come and find us. Find me. My email is tim at rangerup.com. More than reach out. You can, I'll give you my number. You have my number. Yeah. Give it to anybody you want. You can talk to us. And I throw your number out there, Tim. Yeah. <laughs> Straight up. I'll post it online. This, this is the beginning of you. The change has happened. The announcement is made. The wheels are already spinning. And like Cowboy said, we're going to ride it until it breaks, the wheels falls off, or what, we get what we want. And the latter is what's going to happen. So come to us. You are empowered. Make this happen. It's not going to happen without – in unless you call me and we talk about it tonight and everybody else at your gym and everybody else that just, this is the beginning. Get behind it. And to follow up on what Tim just said, there, we'll, be, we'll be traveling around the country and the world. We'll be visiting gyms. We'll be sitting down with you. We'll be at Jackson's with, with Cowboy and Tim. We'll be in Canada with George. We'll be up north in Northern California with Tim. I mean, we're going to be, we will be traveling everywhere and we will be meeting with you. And we'll, you'll know that those meetings are coming. And we'll be able to sit down and we'll answer every question you got. And we've got a full team of people that are working with us. It's not just the guys at the table. There's an entire team behind the scenes as well that will be crisscrossing the country. Um, and we'll be accessible. You can call us at the office. We'll answer every conceivable question you've got, any fear you've got, any question you've got, any concern you have. And we'll fill in the blanks. So there's a, lot of a, support, there's a very substantial support system here with people who understand it. Um, the team's filled with people who have been in the game, who have fought, um, who know the space. You'll recognize their faces. So we will be in contact with you. You can be in contact with us. We'll fill in the blanks. But that's, um, there's an aggressive outreach as well to talk to everybody. Sounds good. Thank you so much. Well, hey, guys. Uh, TJ Sanders from SureDog. I, I want to jump in, uh, too, and, and I have a quick question for you. Uh, obviously, the the letters UFC have been said repeatedly. Is this something that will extend to fighters uh, not under UFC contract, the Bellators, the World Series of Fighting as well? And also, too, we're talking about modern-day fighters. Do you guys have any efforts in place to take care of fighters, you know, from the past generation, the, the Jens Pulvers of the world, uh, Gary Goodridge, et cetera? Will anything be done for those fighters of uh, yesteryear? Yep. No and yes. So the answer to the first question is, just like the NFLPA is focused on the NFL and just like the Major League Baseball Players Association is focused on Major League Baseball, we're focusing on the undisputed um, leader in the space, the four-plus billion dollar enterprise, the most valuable sports property in the history of the world. That's where the focus is. So our efforts and our attention is focused on William Morris Endeavor, IMG, UFC's conglomerate. Um, and in terms of, there, like I said, there's three tiers to what we're going to accomplish here. The first tier is a settlement that we'll achieve, and that settlement will take care of both past and current UFC fighters. So the, the Jen Pulvers of the world and anyone and everyone else who fought in the UFC in the past will be a beneficiary of that settlement. The increase in comp as we push $0.08 cents to $0.50, cents, so it's comparable to every other sport on the face of the earth that's even in the galaxy. And, and again, I don't mean to digress, but when we talk about galaxy, the sale – of the UFC established them as twice as val valuable as Manchester United, far more valuable than the LA Dodgers, infinitely more valuable than the New York Yankees. The Clippers deal, which everybody lost their mind about because they sold for $2 billion, wasn't even half as big. This is a huge, monster sports enterprise. The value of the UFC is over $4 billion. The valuation of WMEIMG is over $6 billion. This is an enormous conglomerate. So, you know, I, I don't want to get overtly aggressive, but it, it is time to step up. Okay. Uh, thank you, guys, for the call. We'll move on to the next one. Thank you. So next to Ariel Helwani with MMAfighting.com. Please go ahead. Hey, guys. Thank you very much for the call. Um, I'll ask the first question to Bjorn. Um, just specifically, if you can, are there any fighters as of now – also on board, or do you just have the five who are with you right now? We've had a lot of conversations. Um, as you know, we live in a very, very small bubble of a world in terms of trying to keep things quiet. 
and we wanted to keep things quiet until we announced. So we've talked to a lot of other fighters. By some freak of nature, nothing really broke until just the last couple of days after the media alert went out. Um, so you'll be seeing a consistent stream of new announcements after new announcement after new announcement over the coming weeks and months. Okay, and have you or anyone who is a part of the team already attempted to reach out to the UFC, and if so, what happened? No, there's no reason to. Our, our structure and what we're doing and our plan of attack does not include us reaching out to the UFC. It includes the implementation of strategies that are designed and have been designed over the last two years to achieve a very specific set of goals. And those strategies, I think, will be very effective at achieving those goals. And at some point, I'm quite comfortable our phone will ring. Okay, so you will make the first contact. There'll be no reason to. Okay, can I, can I squeeze in one more if I can? I know we're, we're limited to two. Don't stop at me. Okay, I'm going to do it anyway. Um, when, you guys, when you guys hang up the phone today and we all go our separate ways, for the layman, what, what are the next steps? Like for, for, for those of us that don't know how this sort of thing actually comes to fruition, because as you know, we've seen a lot of groups come out in this year in particular. We've seen different people trying to get into this you know, space, so to speak. How do you actually get this done when this call is over? Uh, I'll, take, I'll take that. Um, look, Ariel, there's no, there's no substantial benefit to the fighters sitting here with me or to the hundreds of other fighters in the UFC for us to lay out our comprehensive strategy so that the WMEIMG UFC conglomerate knows what's coming and when. Um, we have a well-developed plan to win and a great team in place to orchestrate that plan to win. Uh, and you'll see the results unfold over the coming months. But, and again, not trying to dodge the question, but it, 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 you know, Tim is not going to step into his fight in a week having outlined the specifics of in exactly what he intends to do. So you'll see it unfold. There'll be myriad different uh, aspects of what we're doing and how we're doing it. You'll see them unfold. They will be very, very public in nature. Um, and they'll push us in the direction that we, uh, we must head in. Fair enough. Thanks. Good luck to you guys. All right. Thanks, Laura. Move on to the next question. So next to Liz Mullen with Sport Business Journal. Please go ahead. Hello, gentlemen. Um, I'd, I'd like to ask, because I'm a little bit confused, are you saying that the, is this a trade association that you are forming, or is this a union? You're talking about a collective bargaining agreement and getting the same kind of percentages that the athletes get in other sports? And I just want to be clear, are you forming a union? Great question, um, Liz, and thank you for bringing it up. Um, simply put, a union is the worst possible option today for UFC fighters because it delays everything another four to five years. If everyone at this table were hit by a bus as we leave the hotel, I would plead with UFC fighters not to try to form a union, and here's why. This is why a union doesn't work. A union is an option under the law that's designed to allow employees to pursue and address grievances they have with their employers. UFC fighters are independent contractors. So if you were to spend a year or two years trying to organize to become a union, and if, and it's a huge if, you were ever able to get it formed, the UFC would walk into court the next day, file suit in Nevada to enforce the independent contractor provision in their agreement with every UFC fighter. And then the court battle over that independent contractor status versus employee would take years, years to resolve. And then there's a very, very high likelihood, probably somewhere around 90%, the UFC would win that fight. And then the UFC fighters would be right back where they are now, except it would be 2022 instead of 2016. So, no, we are not forming a union. We are an association, and that is exactly how we're moving forward. All right. Well, then my second question, if I'm allowed, is what power do you have as a trade association? And aren't the fighters on this call under long-term contracts to the UFC? I mean, what, what power do you have by, by, by forming this? And isn't it true that the people on the call are under contract to the UFC? 
they are 100% under contract. And the power that we have is, and again, I'm sorry to jump in, but the power that we have is the power of the voices in this room and the megaphone that most of the athletes in this room speak from and the athletes who will be speaking up over the coming months and the chorus of that message that you'll hear from a media perspective, the introduction to those fighters that George so eloquently spoke about who are forgotten or disregarded, and then a series of additional steps. There is a, and again, Liz, this is hyper-specific to the question you've asked, but when you talk about leverage, WMEIMG is, is in a relatively difficult position. And I'm using rough numbers, but on a $4 billion plus acquisition, approximately $2 billion of that was debt. That $2 billion in debt instrument, let's just assume for a moment that it matures over five years and that it's got an interest rate somewhere around 7.5%. That's three quarters of a billion dollars in interest payments alone that will be due over the next five years. Not five years now, but actually four and a half years. So how do they cover those interest payments? How do you cover three quarters of a billion dollars in interest in the next four and a half years? Well, you increase revenues. How do you increase revenues? Primary way you increase revenues if you're the UFC because 76% of your revenues are due to pay-per-view, domestic television licensing, and international licensing is you'd have to expand and dramatically increase those three revenue streams. What's the boogeyman to every top executive at every network who's being asked to spend hundreds of millions of dollars each year on sports programming? Labor strife. And that's what we have here. So there's a lot of pieces to this puzzle and kidney shots that are going to be delivered on a consistent and ongoing basis, but, and that's just one of them. But this, this group has significant power. All right. Well, thank you. All right, Liz, thanks for the call. You want to jump in here? No. Okay, thanks for the call, Liz. We'll move on to the next caller. We'll go next to Stephen Morocco with MMA Junkie. Please go ahead. Hey, Bjorn. Um, wanted to ask you about something you said about the settlement you guys are speak, uh, seeking for the uh, past and uh, future, uh, past and current fighters. Um, how do you price the value of, of a settlement like that? Uh, again, brother, and it's good to talk to you again. It's been a very, very long time. Um, I, what I wouldn't want to do right now is sit on a phone with you and explain exactly how we would uh, compute what that settlement will look like or how much it will be. It will be extensive and enormous because the wrongs that we've outlined here, um, the wrongs that are spelled out by the numbers, the wrongs that are spelled out by what George and Tim and TJ and Kane probably have said, um, they're not new wrongs. They didn't just start. They've been perpetuated by the new group who's purchased the UFC, which is heartbreaking um, and shocking given the nature of what WME and IMG built their names on, which is supposed to be representing the best interests of clients, athletes, and entertainers. But, um, but we're, you know, look, I'm, I don't think it does us any good or the association of the 500 plus UFC fighters that are impacted by what we're doing to spell out precisely what that will be. It will be large and it will be comprehensive and it will redress wrongs that were committed against prior UFC fighters and current UFC fighters, and that's just one leg of the of the tripod. Okay, so, so uh, handing out a little bit here, um, can, can you just, kind of following up on what Ariel asked before, can you talk a little bit about what the structure of the association will be, like who's playing what role, and, and, and who's going to represent the fighters moving forward? Yep. Um, the, hey, so this is Tim Kennedy. Um, the biggest and most important piece of this is that the fighters are running this association. Period. End of story. Um, Bjorn knows the industry, and he's going to be a very valued advisor in this, and, and a lot of the time, the day-to-day -day operations that we as full-time fighters can't be doing, um, contacting lawyers, talking to agents, talking to promotions, that is not in the wheelhouse of what I'm going to be doing. But the organization is this. The five board members that are going to exist initially, you're talking to right now. We make the decisions. Bjorn is not on the board in any way, shape, or form and cannot make, he can't make a vote when that board comes up to make a decision. So if you want to if you, if you throw stones at who's going to be making and breaking um, the mistakes or the right decisions, it's going to be George St. Pierre. It's going to be Cowboy. It's going to be King. It's going to be TJ. It's going to be myself. Um, I 100% believe that 
we as the fighters have to step up at this moment. Every fighter. You know, what Ariel asked was, where, where's the power? Or what Liz, Liz asked, where, where's the power? Where's the authority? Well, it's in unity. You know, it's in the strength of all of us knowing what's right and wrong. We know what black and white looks like. And we have for a very, very long time been struggling with what is not just, what is not fair, and what is just flat out wrong. And the guys here intimately know that. So the organization is that. The board of this association you're talking to on the phone, and we'll be making the decisions. And so, Bjorn, your, your role is, is what? My role is strategy. My role is support. I'm an advisor. Um, and providing strategic advice to these guys. Like Tim said, when the time comes that we're in a position to be sitting down with WME, IMG, UFC, and, and working through what would turn into a collective bargaining agreement to change things, the decisions as to whether accept that, uh, the proposal and the terms, all rest with these guys. I don't have a vote on the board. Um, I'll literally be providing board agendas and talking through things with the guys and helping. We've got a team on the ground. We've got an office open. We have people working in the office um, who will be helping and assisting. But the decisions in terms of what, where, what benefits work, um, what a pension looks like, what post uh, health care and retirement looks like, what all those different issues look like, those are decisions that are ultimately going to be made by these guys with a tremendous amount of input by every fighter who's actively fighting in the UFC and guys that have previously been in the UFC. Okay, thank you so much. Sure. Okay, thanks, Steve. Let's move on to the next question. So next to Eddie Goldman with No Holds Barred. Please go ahead. Thank you very much. Hello, everybody. Uh, first for Bjorn, I know you don't want to show your whole hand to the UFC, but there have already been a number of efforts in different areas, including an ongoing antitrust lawsuit against the UFC. There's been movement by some members of Congress to have the Ali Act expanded to MMA. And so I'd like to know what the attitude, your attitude and the attitude of this association is to, to those. Okay. It's George St. Pierre. Can I answer this? Mm -hmm. for, for my part, I know that a lot of the agent will be threatened probably by UFC. A lot of the fighter will be threat, will receive threat from the UFC. But I want to let you know something. I make that my, my, my personal fight, and we're not going to be bought to shut ourselves, to shut up. We're not gonna. We're not gonna let any fighters down. We're here to stay. And this same thing that is happening now has happened before in every other sport, like in NFL, NHL, NBA, and now it's, an, it's happening in UFC. It's gonna happen whether they like it or not. I know a lot of fighters r r want to remain un unanimous, but I'm telling you, guys. Come see us, and it's time to stand all together. If I decide to stand now, and, and I've been approached many times in the past for this thing. If I decide, dec decided to stand now, it's because this is the most solid team. This is a very, very solid team that you guys can trust and will make the difference. That's why I can say uh, Bjorn, anything on the uh, antitrust lawsuit or the Ali Act uh, move in Congress, U.S. Congress, obviously? No, Eddie. I mean, look, um, I, I kind of went long and probably too involved into the positioning of why an antitrust suit now doesn't make sense and why we'd be better off taking steps that will allow us to um, secure 100 percent of all the benefits and, that come from this for the fighters as opposed to lawyers. Um, and for the Ali Act, that's an extensive conversation. I mean, look, there's, there's elements of it that speak to exactly what we're talking about here in terms of health and in terms of safety and in terms of relative conflicts of interest and those kind of issues. But, yeah, I mean, could, could there be conversations on that front at some point? Yeah, sure there could because there's like or similar mindsets. And would this organization, if it would come to it, would it plan to run its own MMA shows, or is it just looking to form an association uh, for UFC fighters? Look, Eddie, if, this, if a mixed martial arts association 
and it's the fighters here that have formed it are forming it for the purposes that we've described. It's not a mixed martial arts promotion. Thanks so much, Jenny. Appreciate it. We're going to move on to the next call. We'll go next to Benoit Bodoin with RDS. Please go ahead. Benoit, your line is open. Do you have us on mute? Oh, sorry, I was on mute. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, there was a pro fighter association that was launched a few months ago. Um, what do you think of their venture? Do you plan to work with them? And why did you decide to do something differently from this group? So the, the thing for an association to work is the right team, the heart, the passion, and the understanding of what's right and wrong. We, we, this is not the quick fix. This is not looking for that easy dollar to try to get a settlement, to try to, um, all right, the UFC was just bought, so they have some money sitting aside. This is, you know, let's, let's line our pockets. That's not what the fuck this is. This is five dudes, and now what's going to be 500 fighters, female fighters, retired fighters, champions, every single name that you know and recognize, and, but more importantly, a lot of the names that you don't that are standing up to see change. So that's what the difference is, is that we, we, came, we came together to back the right horse. It was the first time that we had the right team with the right marquee athletes. You know, you can't get George St. Pierre, King Velasquez, Cowboy, TJ in, this, in the room together, but here they are. You know, and they're surrounded by the best and brightest minds that know this sport inside and out. So the difference is we're not there for, to make a quick buck. We're here to change the sport forever so that the fighters that have fought and the fighters that are going to fight have a chance to not be permanently injured and to be compensated fairly for what they've done and for the sacrifices that they've made for the sport. So this is not a union, but is your association plan to negotiate a uh, pension fund and health insurance on behalf of all the fighters in the UFC or because you are, um, you, you are independent contractor, every, every one of you will have to still negotiate your, your stuff with the UFC. What's the plan? The ultimate, the ultimate finalization will be the manifestation of a collective bargaining agreement that will address all those issues. So, it ultimately will be um, one agreement that covers the increases, the pension benefits, the health care benefits. Let's not forget about disability benefits. I mean, look and compare and contrast this to baseball. You sign a four-year deal for $20 million in baseball, you get injured on day number two, you get $20 million. You fight in a cage in the UFC, and you get injured before your fight, and you receive nothing. So. The, the dynamics and the balance in this system is completely off. If somebody told me that those were opposites and that there was a hugely successful sports property that was the most valuable sports property in history, and, you know, but look, the good news is these guys fight in a cage and put themselves through hell, but the positive is that if they do get injured, they get their full purse and they get that year's worth of benefits and anything that they're contracted for for three years or four years, I would say, well, that makes sense. Of course they do. They could break their neck. They could just they could be knocked unconscious and suffer huge head trauma that could result in later CT. They could have horrible injuries. So that's the dynamic. And ultimately we'll be accomplishing it for every UFC fighter, not just for each guy on an individual basis. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, Lloyd. Move on to the next question, please. We'll go next to Dave Debert with Post Media News. Please go ahead. Hi, you guys. Uh, thanks for the time. Uh, just a quick question. Uh, I'll direct uh, first one to George uh, and second one to Bjorn. Um, George, how much does the fact, and perhaps you can address this on behalf of um, you know, fighters in the room, fighters you've talked to, how much does the fact that there's uh, a strong uh, second promotion, specifically uh, Bellator, where fighters have been going back and forth, um, how much does the fact that there's a strong second option for fighters impact making this move now? Uh, and then Bjorn, how long has this been in the works? You mentioned uh, two years uh, came out yesterday that uh, um, some domain names have been registered going back, uh, going back a little ways. If you you could offer some insight into how long this specifically has been in the works. 
Um, I'm not, can you can you repeat your question to me? I'm sorry for. Uh, can you repeat it to me? I'm sorry. Yeah. Well. Um, there's been more movement uh, lately going back and forth between UFC and Bellator, uh, indicating perhaps a stronger second option for fighters other than just UFC. Um, yeah. The fact that that's happening now, how much did that play a role in deciding to make this move publicly now when you are? It's, it's good that it's happening because fighters should, should have the freedom to choose, you know, and, 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 I, th I think it's a, it th I think it's a good thing. Um, for for my part, um, I always say when I compete, I wanted to be known to make as a great fighter, but also I wanted to be known as the one who made the difference. Like the performance and insane drug was not recognized as a true problem in the beginning when I came out with it. I've been laughed at, out, laughed at by by UFC. And now all these problems that I'm talking at, I'm talking about are I'm probably the same thing can happen now. But it's a serious problem. And I'm one of the fighters who travel the most. I've been training in different camps with different guys, different fighters in UFC. And when like I said, when I when you train with people, there's some kind of camaraderie that is that is formed. And you start talking about families and stuff and lifestyle and all those problems that we mentioned come back, no matter if I go train at Jackson or I go train in New York or if I go wherever. It's always the same pattern, the same problems that come back. And that, that's the reason why we're making a stance now. And we're making a stance, and I know exactly what's going to happen. A lot of the agents will be threatened, and I'm repeating myself, by UFC. And they will try to convince their fighter that it's a bad idea to join us. I know because I've been there myself. I've been managed by a friend of a friend before and things like that. And I know it's going to happen. But I'm telling you that face, like face to face to the other fighter, this is the right thing to do. I, can't, I, I, I don't have to do this. I do not. I do not have to fight. I do not have to be implicated into this. I have enough money. I have enough. I can just sit and not work one day in my life. But if I'm doing this, is to make the quality of life better for every fighter. Because I've been on the other side. I'm not born with a silver spoon. And if I'm doing this, it's because I want to change things. I want to be known also as a guy who changed things, and I want to change things for the right. There is nothing. Nothing wrong of, uh, uh, for to stand for what we, for what we stand for today. This is the right thing to do. Nobody can can say that we're doing the wrong thing. We don't want to. We don't. We don't want to do something that is only for the best of our interest. We want something fair on both sides, and that's why we're doing this. So I'm telling the fighter. I know you're gonna be talking with your agent with a lot of guys. Think about the best, if we're doing this, if we're doing this for the best of your, you guys' interest, we're going to fight for you, and we're not going to let you down. We're not going to be bought to, sh to shut up. We, we, we come here because of, 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 our, of our value. All right? Value cannot be, we cannot be buy by money. We're going to be doing the right thing, and we're not going to be stuck. This is something for a long term. This is a long term thing. This is not a quick fix. This is a long term thing. And it's a serious thing, and we have a great team, lawyers, great team behind us. That's why we came, and we make a stance today. Okay, thank you very much. I'm going to move on to the next question. We'll go next to Bruno Montpetit with RBS. Please go ahead. Oui, salut. Une question pour Georges. Georges, si, si tu pouvais nous expliquer en français un petit peu ce que tu viens de dire, c'est quoi les motifs, je sais que tu veux faire changer les choses, c'est quoi les motifs pour lesquels tu t'impliques dans ce projet-là, puis c'est quoi le projet au juste? Oui, en français, en fait, je fais, un, je fais une ré récapitulation. Moi, mon but quand je, quand je, compétitionne à, quand je compétitionnais à l'UFC, c'était d'être connu comme étant le, le, combattant, le meilleur combattant. Mais pas seulement le meilleur combattant, aussi être reconnu comme celui qui a fait de la différence dans le sport. Et si je suis ici aujourd'hui, c'est pour parler d'un problème. En fait, c'est pas seulement un problème, c'est plusieurs problèmes 
qui regroupe tous les, les combattants du UFC. Un petit peu comme quand je suis quand je suis sorti public avec le, le problème euh, des drogues de performance. Au début, le, le UFC a, a ri de moi. Et par après, on a vu que les choses ont changé et qu'ils ont pris le, le problème au sérieux. Alors, ça ne me dérange pas d'être un peu le vilain, de, de, de paraître un peu le, comme le vilain à leurs yeux et de parler des problèmes qu'on a aujourd'hui. Les combattants, ils ont peur de se faire intimider par le UFC pour dire vraiment ce qu'ils pensent. Ils ont peur aussi de se retirer ou de, de se faire rejeter avec, avec, aucun, avec, avec sans argent, avec des problèmes physiques et, et, et mentaux au niveau du cerveau, des commotions cérébrales, sans assurance et des soins pour le, de, reste, de reste de leur vie. Donc, euh, si je suis ici, c'est pour euh, essayer d'améliorer la condition des, des combattants du UFC aujourd'hui. Et euh, c'est quelque chose qui me tient à cœur énormément. Et peut-être que, peut-être que oui, peut-être que non, que je ne me, je me rebattrai jamais au UFC, on ne sait pas. Mais une chose est sûre, c'est je vais faire, je vais faire l'association des combattants mon combat personnel pour rendre la vie meilleure pour les combattants euh, d'hier et d'aujourd'hui. Merci. Georges, j'ai une dernière question. C'est quelque chose qu'on le voit qui tient vraiment à cœur. C'est quelque chose que tu veux changer les, euh, les choses. As-tu l'impression vraiment que les combattants sont exploités par l'UFC? Parce que même quand tu combattais, souvent, tu allais de l'avant pour dire justement que le milieu était difficile et que c'était très dur d'évoluer au sein de ce milieu-là. C'est très difficile. Moi, je viens de... Quand j'ai commencé ma, mes, mon premier combat UFC, j'avais trois jobs. J'avais dans la sécurité dans les boîtes de nuit. Je travaillais aussi dans un magasin de couvre blanchet Je travaillais pour les fonds jeunesse du Canada. Je donnais des cours à des délinquants. Puis aussi, j'étais à l'école. J'étais à l'université. J'étudiais en kinésiologie. Et mon premier combat, à l'époque, j'ai fait 3 000 plus 3 000. Donc, je sais de quoi je parle. Je suis pas né riche et j'ai travaillé fort pour arriver où, où, où j'en suis. Et euh, c'est ça, en fait, c'est euh, ce que j'essaie de faire, ça a été fait dans tous les autres sports, au hockey, au baseball, au basketball. Quand on pense, à, par exemple, au hockey, Maurice Richard, Maurice Richard, il, il se faisait exploiter à l'époque. Je crois que c'était un déménageur. Après ça, il y a eu l'époque avec Guy Lafleur. Guy Lafleur, il se faisait exploiter aussi. Moins, mais il se faisait exploiter aussi. On parle du meilleur joueur de son temps. Alors, aujourd'hui, les, les, les joueurs dans les équipes professionnelles ne se font pas exploiter parce qu'ils ont, ils ont, ils ont, ils ont des gens qui, qui sont là, une association qui sont là pour se battre pour le, pour le, le meilleur de leurs intérêts. Et c'est pour ça que je suis là aujourd'hui. Je suis là pour, essayer, pour commencer un mouvement, une association pour me battre pour, le, pour les intérêts des combattants parce que je sais qu'est-ce qu'ils vivent, parce que je suis passé par là dans le passé. Aussi, je dois juste dire quelque chose qui n'a pas rapport, excusez-moi pour mon français, parce que c'est dur de, de changer anglais en, en français, des fois je me, je me mélange un peu dans mes mots, donc mes notes que j'ai prises, c'était des notes euh, en anglais, donc des fois je me mélange, excusez-moi pour mes anglicismes et euh, mes commentaires, des fois, je suis juste à m'excuser pour ça. Je veux juste me faire comprendre, tu comprends, donc c'est ça qui est important pour moi aujourd'hui. Merci beaucoup, Georges. Thank you very much. Merci. Merci, Bruno. Thank you so much. Uh, we'll move on to the next question. Thank you, Jack Phillips with MMALatest.com. Please go ahead. Uh, yeah, my first question is for Cowboy Cerrone. Uh, Cowboy, you said before that you aren't scared and you put your head on the chopping, chopping block. Uh, we hear a lot about fighters being afraid to voice support for uh a union, or in this case, an association. Is this a nebulous fear of the unknown? Or, I mean, for someone who isn't backstage, what sort of specific retaliation do fighters fear from the UFC? I mean, I don't know. I don't know what to fear. You've got to fear the unknown, but am I scared? Yeah, absolutely, man. But I feel like I've, I've paid my way. I've earned my dues, and I'm standing here with a great team, man, a great team backing me. And, uh, you know, I'm proud to say I'm, I'm I guess I'm, I'm, I'm a little less scared now, you know, and I'm, I'm hoping to to lead the way, start a, a, a revolution, man, and uh, get all the other fighters to stand up with us. And so to answer your question, yes, I'm scared. 
fucking death, man. I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. And uh, I'm still under contract. I still have a fight next weekend, and I'm, I'm healthy and ready to go. And, man, fuck. But, yeah, I don't even know how to appropriate answer that. But, yes, uh, so it's just going to take It's going to take a lot, of, a lot of work, a lot of time, and, and getting everything in order that we need to do. Awesome, awesome. Um, and I know it's been a lot in the news. Uh, so I guess TJ Dillashaw, I suppose I should uh, ask this one too, about fighters getting passed over for uh, title shots. I know we're talking about um, important stuff like like taking care of your family and, uh, and health care, but would you be willing to use collective bargaining uh, the same way the Ali Act works to sort of ensure that the most deserving contender gets uh, gets the shot? I mean, it'd be nice, but this ultimately comes down to a lot more than that. Um, but uh, UFC's, when it comes down to UFC's, allowed to do whatever they want. You know, they're, they're, they're sole promotion. They can they can put whoever's going to make them the most money or put the position of, of the guys they want there because that's what they want. Um, yes, it should be going off a ranking system. It should go off what's most deserving. And I do believe that, but this is even bigger than that. You know, this, this just proves that the UFC can do whatever they want. All right. Thank you very much, fellas. All right. Thank you. Let's move on to the next question, please. We'll go next to R.C. Samo with Fanbo- Fanboy Nation. Please go ahead. Good afternoon, gentlemen. This is revolutionary, and I'm glad that, that you guys are finally putting this together. Uh, Tim obviously isn't scared of anything because he's a ranger, and uh, I've, I've spoken with him before, and I respect him a great deal. Don't care. Don't care. Uh, what's that? <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I know Cowboy's a little frightened of, all, of what could go down, but of the repercussions that could happen from all of this, what's the worst that could come of it from the UFC coming down on you guys, and what's the best-case scenario that you hope for once uh, everything goes into play? Let, let me... Let me touch on that real quick. This is Bjorn. And okay. uh, there's, there's a legal aspect to this that needs to be touched on, and it's really important. Mm-hmm. There is, and I won't go into a recitation of the laws on a state-by-state or federal level, but there is law after law after law on the books that prohibits employers from retaliating against people in this fashion. So the, the opportunity that... From a rogue action perspective, seven years ago or six years ago, where Dana White made any decision he wanted on a whim and tweeted it out with you know, both fingers in the air, that's a different scenario. But with WMEIMG on board and with 50 or 60 attorneys sitting in the second floor of their offices, the ability of that company to retaliate against Cowboy or to retaliate against Tim or TJ or Kane or George or 500 other fighters is virtually not existent as counterintuitive as it sounds, and I know it sounds wacky coming out of my mouth, but if you talk to top lawyers about what's going on here, it actually provides an additional layer of protection to the fighters who do speak up because you have voiced your displeasure with an outrageous out-of-whack system. And if then the UFC and WME and IMG steps up and cuts you, takes advantage of you, cuts your teammates, does anything from a retaliatory perspective, that is deep, deep, deep trouble from them from a legal perspective. So there are the, the, the option that they had to act in the way that they acted six years ago or five years ago or even three years ago, where they literally did anything they wanted, like the wild, wild west, has been reined in. This is Tim Kennedy. Um, you know, one of, one of the efforts, in addition to the compensation, in addition to the health care, the pensions, helping the hurt fighters of the past, it's also to professionalize the sport. You know, the, Doran said it was three years ago. You know, I, I can look across the table at TJ and know that, you know, politics have played into title shots. You know, when you get a fight, who you're going to fight, if you're going to fight, That is all subjective to matchmakers that work for the UFC. So while they don't have to or couldn't necessarily penalize us or, you know, come out and they can give us bad matches or they can give us no matches or they could not give us the title that they deserve and give it to another steroid-using guy. Um, The fact that they can give a guy that's been failed, that has failed steroid tests on multiple times, another title shot, at their pleasure because of their subjective opinion of what's going to sell pay-per-view is insane. 
So an effort in this is to professionalize the sports. The brothers and sisters that are going to be standing up together, our fellow fighters, to see the change is to see this sport grow up. We just got sold, and it is now the biggest sell in sport history. We have grown up. These fighters have not been taken care of as if the sport has. The fans need to understand that there has been a huge travesty, that there is a, that there is a void. If, if I wasn't fighting and I was a fan, I don't know if I could watch another fight knowing the repercussions of what happens to these athletes after the fact, after, after they step out of the cage. You know, the fans need to get behind this and need to understand that we, you know, we are trying to grow this sport up. We want to work with the UFC and watch this sport grow. We want to be the biggest. We want to surpass the NFL. We want to see that. That means that we're making more money, the UFC is making more money, everybody's making more money, and everybody's happy. So the risk versus the reward could be there. It's just not there right now. Uh, gentlemen, thank you so very much. Okay, thank you. And we'll move on to the next question. We'll go next to Matthew Bull with Art Voice. Please go ahead. Hi guys, my first question is for Bjorn. It may have been touched on already. Um, any plan or benefit, uh, either way, that you see in in uh, bringing uh, Couture's group into into your fold? The question for DSP or I suppose any of the fight that might issue um, on it. You mentioned the one name that nobody else has mentioned. Uh, it always comes up in the MMA conversation, Conor McGregor. He plans to reach out to him. And We're sorry, we, your phone is going in and out. Could you, re, could you repeat that? We missed the name. Um, yeah, I'll repeat the whole thing. Um, my first question is for Bjorn. Do you think that... Um, do you think that there would be any benefit um, or plan to reach out to Courtois' group and try and bring them into your fold? And my second question is for any of the fighters that would like to take a crack at it, if you would like to. Um, GSP mentioned Conor McGregor, uh, which has not come up other than that one time in this conversation. Um, is there any plan, if, if you can say so, is there any plan on reaching out to him and trying to get him on board with this? Thank you. Um, it's George. It's George uh, speaking. Um, for it's for for Conor McGregor. We all know he's the biggest draw in UFC. I cannot speak for him, but hear, hearing what he says in the in the interview, it looks to me that he's aware of what's going on. And even Conor is the most well remunerated fighter in the organization. He still doesn't have his fair share of what he should have. Even him, he doesn't have his fair share. And I'm saying this to the tough contestant, to Conor McGregor, they don't have their fair share. And I know a lot of fighters, they talk bad about Conor because it's the business, you know. They, a lot of them, sometimes they, they, they could be jealous because he's, 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 a great, he's also a great fighter, but he's also someone who sells himself very well and he did very well for himself. For me, I'm not jealous. I'm very happy for him. But there's something I think about Conor McGregor. I've met him a couple of times. Conor McGregor is someone... You have, two, you have the Conor McGregor, a human being, and the Conor McGregor business. And when the one you see in the business is the Conor McGregor... The, the one you see in the UFC is the Conor McGregor, the business. But the Conor McGregor human being, I, because I've talked to him, I've met him before, I know... I know, I know for sure he, he, he knows what's right. And Connor is, you know, he, nobody is a perfect human being, but Connor is not a, he's not a coward. You know, he's, he knows what's right, and everybody knows what we're doing is right. So, of course, we would like to have on board the biggest name in the sport, and we, we need it. And UFC will probably do everything they can to, have, to, make, a, to, to, to make it not happening. But every every voice counts for us. To the to the biggest draw in the UFC, to the the the, the smartest fighter, every voice count count. It's very important for us that everybody come on board, and and we we will take care take care of you, and we will 
We will hear what you have to say, and we will protect you. And, and uh, in answer to your the earlier part of the question to me, uh, look, I, I just I, I explained it at great length why the union alternative is a disaster for the fighters, and any kind of act. And look, I'm a huge Randy fan. I have huge monster respect for him. I've watched every one of his fights for years and years and years. But any overture that's already got a litigation filed, I think is counterintuitive to what we ultimately want to accomplish. Because I believe that the strategies in place and teams in place, people are in place to win this fight prior to filing a lawsuit. So to preemptively file a lawsuit, which takes a third of everything that comes of it and puts it into someone else's hands when it should go into the hands of fighters, I think is, uh, is not a great strategy. So we, we wouldn't be aligning with anyone who was currently following that strategy, although we would welcome Randy Couture with open arms to join us in what we're doing because he's, you know, smart as all get out and understands the sport backward and forward and has had his well-documented problems for years and years and years with the UFC. Um, so he'd be welcome to step in with us. Okay, thank you so much for the question. Who wants the next question? So next to Elias Cepeda with Champions.com. Please go ahead. Thanks for the time. Um, two quick questions. First is for George. George, does this mean that you've kind of given up uh, the hope of fighting again in the UFC, uh, or do you still hope to be able to fight while fighting for other fighters? Um, and um, the other question is for anyone that wants to answer it. Um, is there a formal process for other fighters that you're inviting to join you? Is there like a signing cards type of thing? And, and where is the, the, the backing to do all this uh, coming from as of right now? So, uh, yeah, this is, this is George. For, for me, it doesn't change anything. I, the reason why I didn't fight in your city is because the deal they were offering me was not fair. It's not a question of uh, people, they make a question of money. It's like they, they were saying to me, I'm a big risk. But if I'm a big risk, we, 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 you know what I mean? It, 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 I'm a big risk, but they, you know, they, they wouldn't let me free, you know, like, like in, in, a, in a way. So it contradicts itself. In terms of, for my situation, I can say it's, I haven't fought, we met USA and I several times. I haven't fought because the, the situation, the deal they were offering was not fair. I didn't have my fair share of what I should have got. And it was always, a, uh, if you do that, then after you, you know it. No, we don't have, I, I didn't have my fair share. And everybody, most fighters I talk to, all the fighters I talk to, they don't have their fair share. Like I said again, to the top contestants, to the biggest run, you see, they don't have their fair share. And it doesn't mean that I retire, that I'm out. For me, I'm in the best shape of my life, but I, I want to fight for what is right. What kind of person would I be if I go back for a deal that is not my fair, that is not fair to me? So that means I'm standing for something that I didn't even, that I didn't even do my, for myself. You understand what I mean? So for me, it's wrong. So if I stand for something, it's because I believe in it and I'm going to do it even for myself. I'm going to fight for it for myself and also for other people. Hope you understand what I mean by that, you know? Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Guy, Thank you. Hopefully, sometimes I, 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 it's confusing, but I hope you get the message true. <laughs> we will. Thank you, George. All right. Thanks so much. Appreciate the call. Move on to the next call. We'll go next to Aaron Bronsbetter with TSM. Please go ahead. Hi, guys. So two quick questions. Uh, the first question is, with WME, IMG, and CAA being such big rivals, um, and obviously Bellator and the UFC being rivals, do you think that optically it doesn't look great that most of the athletes involved with this are CAA-represented athletes? You know, the name JP Aaron Tibia came up. He's represented by CAA Sports. Um, does this go beyond MMA? And then my other question is for, for George. Uh, George, are you... Um, you know, you mentioned on the MMA hour that you were a free agent. Is that something you still stand by? My, 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 I have to be very careful of how I'm going to answer this question because it can be used in court. 
Uh, my lawyer, James Quinn, told me I'm a free agent. But you know how it is. There is two sides of the situation, and it has to sometime it could be in court, and that's all I can say. But from my side, I have a good, good reason. My lawyer is the best at, in this kind of, of, uh, of, of uh, situation. He told me I'm free agent. So I am free agent from my side of the situation. We have very strong evidence that I'm free agent. Very confident. That's why I can say. And in follow-up to your question, I, I, look, I spent a long time at the beginning of the call explaining the dichotomy and how WMEIMG is treating athletes. Um, I don't think there's anything at all questionable about the fact that they're collection of CAA clients here. They're, they're handling this situation and supporting their clients in something their clients want to do in a forthright way and what you would expect agencies to do, exactly how you would expect an agency that is looking out for the best interests of their athletes or their entertainers to function to try to provide them a, a, a better future and a safety net and pension benefits and health care benefits, simple stuff that every athlete on the face of the earth, whether they're NHL or NBA or Major League Baseball or NFL, receive and have received for decades. And now that we all know, which a lot of us have known for a, a long time, the voluminous value, the unbelievable valuation that the UFC has because it has been a money, money printing machine year after year, decade after decade. So it, it doesn't surprise me at all that one agency would stand up and say, we will support our guys and not support the association as a standalone or back it or have anything, any financial vested interest in it. And then another would purchase the UFC and keep perpetuating the same wrongs. That's a sad commentary. This is so, so, if you don't mind me asking, what's in this for you? Like, what, what, how do you benefit from this? Well, so far I've been working on it for two years and haven't received a penny, and I'm currently not getting paid. So I get to hang out with Tim Kennedy and Kane and TJ. Um, you know, it, like I said before, um, and I don't mean to sound like an old baseball catcher, but MMA was very good to me, and it's an opportunity to, I think, dramatically improve the sport. Look, here's the cold, hard reality. We're not going to have a mixed martial arts sport if these things don't change. This sport on this trajectory cannot continue. I grew up in a household from the time I was six years old where Latin American fighters and Mexican fighters lived with our family. I've seen firsthand for 46 years what happens to fighters, boxers, and mixed martial artists. I've been around this sport since I was a child, and it's frightening. It's not a happy ending for a lot of the guys who compete. So if you don't step up, if we're not able to change this, if you can't create a dynamic where there's a safety net, where there's a pension, where there's health care benefits when T.J. Dillashaw is 46, you have huge problems on your hand. This sport doesn't continue. Tim spoke to it. This thing is about, is about ultimately fixing this wrong and then coming together and working as a unified team to try to create a dynamic with the UFC where the UFC is making $2 billion or $3 billion or like the NFL, $13.3 billion a year. But at 13.3, the athletes that are sitting in this room and the athletes that are out there listening should be receiving 6.4 or 6.5 of it. That's the way the dynamic should work. And if it doesn't get fixed, those of us who love MMA and think it's the greatest sport in the world, we're not going to have an MMA in 10 years because the repercussions and the ramifications from that kind of conduct are going to kill this sport. Okay, thank you very much for the call. Move on to the next one. We'll go next to Mike Straka with MMA Noise. Please go ahead. Hey, guys. Hey, uh, Doran, quick question on business, on the business side of things, and also to uh, Tim Kennedy as well. Are you guys funding this yourselves? You're talking about uh, going around the world and visiting gyms and talking to fighters. That costs a lot of money. How are you guys going to fund that? Uh, well, by the way, it's good to talk to you again. It's been a long time. Miss you, brother. Thanks, Bjorn. Um, you too. Miss you too, guys. Look, there are, uh, there are some people who have stepped up, and the people who initially came to me on this venture two-plus years ago were people who I've got a, a crazy amount of respect for and admire them for what they saw as something that was terribly wrong and something they wanted to fix. Um, and at this stage, this organization has all of the pieces in place and all of the requisite backup and backing necessary 
to be able to implement the strategies that they articulated to me um, over a series of excited meetings about what they felt they could help change. Um, and so we're, we're in a very, very stable, very good spot. We've got offices open. You can visit the website, the MMAAA.com. There are people working in the offices as we speak, man and phones, and there's a team, et cetera. So it, it is all in motion as we speak. Where's your headquarters? Anaheim Hills, California, Orange County. Okay. All right, guys, thanks. All right, thanks so much. Oh, are we good? Then move on to the next question. We'll go next to Josh Gross with The Guardian. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you for uh, taking the questions. Um, guys, earlier in the call, Bjorn mentioned uh, the option of a, of a labor strike. I'm just wondering your reaction to that for the fighters. Is that something that you're already accepting as a potential uh, outcome of, of the formation of this association? And are, can you just articulate your willingness to do that? Um, this is Kane. Um, as far as the strike, I mean, that's not what we want. You know, we want to work with the UFC, help them grow even more, and, and just have ourselves taken care of. You know, as far as what they're getting in the UFC, I think it needs to be more fair across the board with the fighters and also just, you know, for the long-term health care that, that all of us deserve. You know, we want to be teams, be a team with the UFC, have that pride like, you know, I used, I used to fight in the UFC and it's like I, I look back and say, hey, they're taking care of me. This is this is great. You know, I'm I'm a big fan of the UFC still, um, of the company that the company that I used to fight for. Yeah. Hey, this is Tim Kennedy. Um, hey Josh, the no, we don't want something to be taken out of context. What Jorn specifically said was that that was the worst fear uh, was a strike. That is that is that has not been threatened. That hasn't been. I mean, the, the mention of it was that is that is realistically for any employer, especially one that your entire revenue source is existent with your labor, that is your worst fear. Um, that is not what we're talking about at all. What we're talking about is working with the UFC and building the UFC to be the most massive sport establishment on the face of the planet. That's what I want. I, I want to have a legacy. So does everybody at this table. You know, with you know, champions sitting here, even in Bjorn as a former promoter, whether he's righting or wrongs, like his heart is in the right place to see change. And the legacy that we're going to be leaving behind is is finally putting something to what's just and what's right. You know, we're empowering our brothers and sisters, fellow fighters, to contact us, to reach out to us, so that we can all stand together. And that is not not fighting. That is coming together and saying change needs to be made. And we all recognize and realize that that has to happen. And the only the only way, and the best way for that to happen, is to do it together. But, but as a hammer, as a tool, that's what Bjorn was talking about. Obviously, that's the worst case scenario, and you don't want that, and the UFC doesn't want that. But no, is, is that a step that you'd be willing to take? What we're talking about here is an unsustainable trajectory. Where the UFC is headed right now, if you look at every single fighter that has retired and left the UFC, those motherfuckers can't walk. They can, they can, they are, there's memory problems, their personalities have changed. What I'm saying is the sport as it is is unsustainable. So let's not even talk about strikes. That's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about changing the sport. We're having a paradigm shift of what the expectation is for the compensation of the athletes to make sure that they're protected and taken care of. Where heavyweight champion sitting across me that's about to have a seventh or eighth surgery knows that his wife who's in the room with us is going to be taken care of. Let's not bring the drama into this. That's not what this is about. Okay, this is okay. about changing the face of the sport for the better. Okay, where we are now, we may not have a sport in five to ten years because the athletes know that we can't continue doing it because we won't be able to walk. I don't want to be in a wheelchair. I'm a hunter. I'm still in special forces. I have eight more years before I can retire within special forces. Like, and don't think that the military won't get theirs if I'm a broken version of myself. So we, we are here with our hearts in the right place trying to do the right thing in the best way that we can, which is working with the UFC. Okay, thanks okay. so much. One, 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 more, one more, please, if I can get it in. Just, it's, it's a larger sport. It's not just the UFC. Um, do you feel no um, uh, need to advocate on behalf of fighters and Bellator? Viacom is a giant company. Do, do they not deserve these protections and these pensions as well? Yes, they absolutely do. What, just like any other, if you look at every professional sport in the world right now, um, let's look at baseball. 
um, as we have other professional baseball players here that are kind of talking to us and helping structure strategically what we're going to be doing, there are a lot of minor leagues, you know, but you have to make it to the pros. You gotta, you gotta play for the Red Sox. You gotta play for the Yankees. You gotta play for the Dodgers. Once you're there, you've made it, right? And and that's where we are right now. For this to work and for this to be kicked off and for this to really come to fruition, this is the starting point. I'm not saying we're not gonna grow and be able to provide protections into all the multiple myriad of other promotions that exist. But the starting line, where we are right now, the five meter target for us to be able to accurately affect change is this, is the UFC. So where we're going to go from here, man, the sky's the limit. If you look around this table, you see hard work and blue collar believers that change needs to happen. We have like the, the, the most prolific champion in UFC history that is coming back to say, you know, he already has legacy, but he's now trying to affect change for a permanent improvement of the sport. Okay, thanks so much for the call. We're going to move on. Next question, please. Hello, next to Michael Stett with MMA Mania. Please go ahead. Uh, thanks for your time. What, what are, for Bjorn Fierce, what, for Bjorn first, what are the, like, short-term goals? I know you said you, you want to have a settlement for past and present fighters, 8% to 50, but what is it you have to do to achieve that? Do you have to get the support of, say, 50% of the roster? What, what are your short-term goals, like a list of what you need to do to put these plans into effect? Again, and look, I'm, I'm by no means trying to sidestep the question. From a strategic outlay perspective in terms of what's A, B, C, D, and E, we, I don't think it makes a lot of sense to divulge that and to say, hey, here's what we're going to be doing next. But obviously part and parcel of it is organizing. Part and parcel of it is, is every guy at Jackson's reaching out to Cowboy and reaching out to Tim. It's about AKA and talking to Kane. It's a whole group of articulations of what's going on, who's involved, what the long-term goals are. That, that begins it. That will be complemented by a great deal of media. As George said, we're going to be making introductions, not just from an endemic market MMA perspective, but also from a general market media perspective to a lot of the fighters who have suffered uh, largely at the hands of fighting in the UFC and are now suffering the consequences for that. And there's going to be a series of overtures that you're going to see. There's a, when you organize something like this, you create what's called a plan to win. And it's just like somebody that gets ready to train for a fight and a couple of months out or two months, three months out has a structure in place of exactly what he or she is going to do. And we have that structure in place. And like George said, something like this doesn't get taken care of overnight unless, of course, like I said previously, the UFC wants to step up and, and equal a 53 mark, in which case um, the resolution of these matters quite quickly. But, I mean, do you, can you list any type of, uh, you know, because it's not to reiterate the question again, but there, there has to be some type of plan in place that you want to do, like step one, step two. Sure, you're going to, like we've discussed on this call and everybody's articulated, you'll see these fighters in gym talking, traveling around the country, meeting with other fighters who shed light on exactly what we're doing and share with them one-on-one -on -one what those plans are. There's an organizing team that here that includes JP and includes um, the hardest working, most trustworthy and honest employee I ever had, Zach Light, um, who's working with us as well, and other team members who are going to be crisscrossing the country. Because what you've got to do first, like Tim said, is you've got to shed light on exactly what's going on, what the need is, and what this ultimately means. If, if you look at the numbers, and I, I'm I don't mean to go like too deep, give you too much of an answer, but if you look at the numbers, at 8% versus 50%, you look at a guy that's making 12 plus 12, a guy at 25,000, that increase is not an incremental small increase. You're talking about a guy making 12 plus 12 that ultimately could walk away with $125,000 per fight. If you're one of the fortunate guys that's making 25 plus 25, and you're walking away with a win at 50 grand, that turns into a quarter million dollar a night purse. If you're one of the freaks of nature in the UFC, the rarity, the pink ostrich that's making a hundred grand, you're talking about a five hundred thousand dollar night. And look, here's the cold hard reality. That reality for the NFL and NBA and Major League Baseball and NHL, those owners are still profitable. Robert Kraft, who bought into Ari Emanuel's sale of the debt on the UFC instrument, 
Robert Kraft isn't operating the Patriots so that he can lose money. He's making money. And he's paying his athletes, Tom Brady and the rest of them, 50% of every dollar that comes in his door. So what are we talking about? How, how does this dynamic exist today? And, and to this point, we have stood by and allowed it to occur. Because the, the, the fixing of it and the remedy is a remedy that can be done and still allow WMEIMG to make a profit, a comparable profit to every owner in Major League Baseball or the NHL or, or, or the NFL. So it is questions remain. Have you sought the advice of, say, DeMaurice Smith from the NFL Players Association and, and um, uh, say, Tony Clark from the Major League P uh, Baseball Players Association? Have they given input on possible strategies you can use for, like you said, a collective bargaining agreement? Yeah, sure. Tony's awesome. We've talked to Tony. We've talked to uh, a ton of people. I mean, look, the, the, the magician, the Michael Jordan we've got on our team is Jim Quinn. Jim Quinn is the Michael Jordan of antitrust litigations. He's the Michael Jordan of athlete association related litigations. Google Jim Quinn and athletes and see what comes up. He wrote the book. So we've got him on our team. And we've, we've talked to some very smart people. And Tony's been hugely supportive. We talked to Tony Clark two years ago as he, at the infancy of this, over, of this undertaking. So yeah, of course, we've gotten some input from folks from major, major organizing campaigns across the country who have dealt with voluminous, large-scale labor issues. And this one just happens to have a, an enormity of ugly on one side of it. So it is an easier one to address because the, the difference between what should happen and what is happening is so crystal clear. Thanks, Jordan. Just, if I could squeeze one in for George, if possible. Uh, George, was this something kind of eating away at you in your time away from the UFC? Did you feel kind of a, a magnetic pull because of your stature and, and uh, you know, who you are in the sport, your reputation, did you, did you feel kind of it pulling towards you like you were, you were one of the top guys to be able to fight for the other fighters? Well, whether if I would, if I would be in, on fighting right now or not, I would have to take that stand as well. Um, I'm, I'm in a great situation now, like I said, I, I, I'm, if I, say, I come here today, it's because I take that stand. But I couldn't have made that in the beginning of my career because I was, you know, I was this, this, in the same situation as like, some of the guys that, that are afraid. And I would have liked at the time if someone, like, who has a bigger draw the, at the time would have taken a stand to protect me so I would not have done it today. Um, unfortunately, the infrastructure was not in place. This thing has been repeatedly done in every sport, in Major League Baseball, NHL. I'm from Canada, so in, I can talk to you about hockey because that's what I know best in, in team sport. I mm -hmm. remember the best player of their time, Maurice, Maurice Richard, used to be exploited by the NHL. After that, you had another era, the best player was Guy Lafleur. He was exploited, but not as much. Then you had the era of Wayne Gretzky. That was less. Then after you have the era of today. Today the, the, the player, the, their condition of work are much better. But it you, has to start somewhere, and that's what we're doing today. We, we, we started to increase the, the, the condition of work of the fighter. We're not here to, 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 we're here to, to elevate the UFC. We want to elevate the UFC. Of course, they're not gonna like it first because they won't be. They want to have. They they like powers. Like every man who has power, they want more power. Now we're taking a little bit of power out of them and we put it into the fighters' hands. And you you would have taken the stand for me that this is done in the correct way. I'm sorry. We have to move on. We have a few more questions we want to get in. So thank you so much for the call. We'll go next to Mike Chiapetti. Chiapetta with uh, Bleacher Report. Please go ahead. All right, so I'll, I'll follow up with George, please. Um, you guys mentioned this is supposed to be a UFC fighters only association, but George, you reiter reiterated once again on this call that you're a free agent. Um, that seems a little inconsistent. Can you explain how that works? Well, you have my version of the story, and you have the UFC version of the story, right? So, yes, 
yeah. So, so because of legal reason, I cannot ex- extrapolate uh, extrapolate on that. But see, see, <laughs> you, you know what I mean by right in this situation. Hey, this is Tim. Um, it's not just current UFC fighters. We're, we're we we are reaching out to the Randy Couture's to. Um, the Kung Lees to the Nathan Corys that have their own thing going, but this is about people that have fought for the UFC, and I'm pretty sure if we look at George St. Pierre's record that he's fought for the UFC and won the title and defended it more than times than any one else. I mean, like, so, um, you know, there might even be people on this, George may never fight again, or he may fight in a couple months from now. Or I can fight for another organization. He will still absolutely be part of this association because of what he has done and that is fought for the biggest and best organization on the planet, the Ultimate Fighting Championship. Not only fought for them but won titles for them and then defended them on countless times. So retired guys, like this, this, this is about at a grassroots level building an association that can stand unified to make change for the better, right? Brothers and sisters, fighters that have done and put their blood in the octagon, George has done that more than all of us. So it's not just to be perfectly clear, um, while he may not be fighting right now, or he may fight for a different promotion in the future, um, he has fought for the UFC and he's a welcome addition (laughs) to this board. Okay. Thanks for the clarification. I just have one other question for Bjorn. Uh, You said, you know, people have stepped up to fund the association. Obviously most people don't fund ventures related to multi-billion dollar businesses out of the goodness of their heart. So, um, what are those people getting out of being part of this? Again, um, they're getting far less than they would get if they put money behind Apple or Toyota or any other major company that's functioning well that you can invest in. But the, the reasoning behind the people who stepped up behind this was much less about money and much more about the ability to make change where they saw that change was desperately needed. So I think it would be out of line on my part to be able to discuss the specifics of what somebody who has stepped up with a group to help make this happen is getting out of it. But um, there are uh, other ventures that you could step into that have a much higher upside or potential multiple on that investment. But um, the heartfelt reasoning behind it was what got me into it at the get-go. And then uh, just a realization of the facts. Hey, this isn't – this is Tim Kennedy again – this, this this isn't like a, a money making opportunity. Hey, Cowboy, what did you get paid to come here? Nothing. Uh, Austin, buddy. Yeah, you an asshole stole my striking coach <laughs> for him to come here. Um, Kane. No. Uh, uh, TJ. Yeah, nothing. Okay, there, we're not getting for now. Yeah, we're I'm, we're all in fight camps right now. <clears throat> TJ is. Kane is. Cowboy and I fight it, like next weekend. Um, we're we're here for a legacy. For, for the future. That's, that's why George is here. Even if he doesn't fight again, he's going to make change. He's an advocate for the future. And we're not paid to be here. And it's, we're not talking like hundreds of thousands of dollars as we hop on private planes flying to talk to gyms. I, I, I'm going to be in the gym tomorrow. And I'm going to talk to people about the fight. Kane's going to be in the gym tomorrow. TJ is going to be in the gym tomorrow. Um, and we're going to have these conversations. It's not like we need to, you know, be setting up limos to fight these guys. I, this, this isn't. This is about for the fighters. This, this, that is what this is. This is not a cash cow. This is not an opportunity to break in dough. This is about change. Okay. Thanks so much. Thank you guys. Good luck thank to you. you. We'll go next to Nathan Hendrickson with Funny MMA. Please go ahead. Yes, uh, I was wondering if uh, Mr. Rebney could uh, go into just a little bit more detail about how all this is being funded. Like I said, um, there's some great people behind this who stepped up two years ago to make this happen, and the guys have stepped up behind it. We've got a great team on board. We've got everything in place to make this work and to see it as see it through to the end, which is success and the achievement of the goals that I outlined, the three different kind of pillars of that that tripod, but I'm not going to go into specifics about the who because they asked me not to go into specifics about the who. Good people, and God willing, I'm going to have the opportunity to divulge them and um, disclose who they are at some point because it gave me a lot of pleasure to be able to do that. Okay, and if I could just wedge in one more. Uh, you mentioned about uh, doing something for uh, retired fighters, former fighters. 
Uh, could you go into a little bit more detail about that, uh, how that might affect someone like a Mark Coleman or a uh, Don Fry? Yeah. I mean, look, the, the Mark, and we could go through name after name after name. That's the tragedy. That is, that is a large, large part of this tragedy, is that you can name two quickly because you're asking one question, but if I quizzed you, you could, you could name three dozen, four dozen, five dozen, Every, everyone sitting around this table knows it. So the essence of that, of trying to create that safety net and trying to create a settlement vehicle that can put some of those guys into a better spot is part and parcel of what we're doing. It's, like Tim said, it's not just about the current guys, it's about the prior guys. And it's about being able to set them up so that there's some kind of cushion and some kind of benefit that they can derive from having fought in the octagon 10, 12, 14, 20 times and now having nothing to show for it. So it's part and parcel of what's, what's happening. Okay, thanks so much. We have a few more calls left. Let's move on. We'll go next to Niall McGrath with SevereMMA.com. Please go ahead. How are you getting on, guys? Uh, appreciate the time today. There was rumors that there might be um, a female board member involved. Um, how has the interest been from the female point of view? Hey, man, right now, um, this was about getting a bunch of passionate believers in this cause in the room as soon as we possibly can at the most. This is not a convenient date for any of us. Um, th we, I, I, I'm not going to name names, but like Bjorn said, we're going to start talking about who's behind this already, and there's hundreds um, to include some of the most fundamental pillar stones of the sport. You know, the, the from like right now, I'm, I'm on my phone getting blown up by by some female fighters. I'm, I'm on board 100%. Let me know. Um, I'm, there, this is about fighters. Fighters is is a genderless thing. It's it's men and women, and it's all the fighters from the UFC former and today that are coming together. So they, you know, are they going to be part of the board? Yes. Are they going to be part of the decision-making factor? Are they going to be on the front lines with us in every sh way, shape, and form? This is a genderless thing. And, um, but for the, the five that are in this room right now, it was just happenstance of who could get here on this date to make this happen. There was a list of names and we were trying to pick which ones could make it happen. And, and these are the ones that we have here right now. But in the very, very near future, the, I mean, the most, the biggest, the most marquee, marquee names for female fighters um, are going to be part of this, I promise. Just one more for Bjorn. Bjorn, um, people are going to ask why you didn't get involved in something like this when you were president of Bellator MMA. Uh, why now? Why now? Why now? I mean, it, you know, look, if you look at the role of a promoter, and that is a role I've played for an awful lot of years, the role of a promoter is not one that lends itself very easily to becoming a strategic advisor from a 12 to 15 hour a day basis to a fighters association. They're counterintuitive. And so, you know, I mean, it's just, it's the nature, it's the nature of being a promoter. And, and so part of the expertise that I bring to this, as some Tim said, is I, I know how this industry works. I know what a, a promoter is trying to achieve. I know where the revenues come from. I know what the expense line items look like. I know what the budget for large-scale and small-scale events looks like. I know what international television, domestic TV, pay-per-view looks like. I've done all of that. So I have a very keen understanding of what that is. I can tell you firsthand, when you're functioning as a promoter for a major promotion in this sport, your, your focus is, wouldn't be this. And as we've seen very clearly from the UFC for an extended period of time, and as we've seen in the carryover from WMEIMG, their intent is to continue doing business the same way, and that's why this has got to change. But the timing, I wasn't out of the game very long when I was approached about the potential of doing this, and I've done some great things in the interim and had some fun and reintroduced myself to my kids, but, um, but this was something that really caught my eye and said, you know, this is something where we could make a difference. We could, we could change something, and across the board, people would look at it and say, those are great changes. Okay, thank you guys. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. All right, thanks so much. We have two last questions we want to squeeze in. Can we go to the next one, please? Certainly, we'll go next to Stephen Gavin with FightersideChat.com. Please go ahead. Hello, guys. Thank you again for taking our questions. Um, question one is MMAAA, have they filed the charter as a labor organization? No, it's, it, 
the Mixed Martial Arts Athletes Association is a 501c6 problem in the state of California. The actual tax exempt status hasn't been granted yet, but that's that's where we the organization is from a progressive perspective. Okay, and the second question, if you don't mind. Now, you've mentioned Major League Baseball, the NFL, um, NHL a couple times during this call. Now, Major League Baseball is required to to negotiate with the union because of an antitrust exemption, as is the NFL and the NHL. Now, I know the fighters, um, the Lee et al. suit was filed a couple of years ago, and it's scheduled for class certification within the next year. Now, how do you intend on reaching the point of a Major League Baseball Players Association that's mandated to negotiate by Congress without having that antitrust exemption? I lost part of. I, I didn't. Um, let, me, let me try to clarify. I apologize. We didn't hear everything yeah, you said. You broke up. My, my apologies. Major League Baseball is required to negotiate with the with the MLBPA via congressional mandate. It's part of the antitrust exemption. I'm saying with the NFL, the, the NBA, NHL, etc. Now you have said that you intend on bringing the UFC to the table to negotiate money for past fighters, etc. How do you intend on doing what requires congressional mandate from the major four sports without having that type of leverage? Well, look, and again, big question that would require an awful lot of time to go through at, at length ad nauseum. But it, uh, it, given a quick your answer would be fine, sir. Yeah, given your knowledge in the space, obviously at some point in the future when we're sitting down and negotiating a CBA on behalf of the association, the USC in an attempt to maintain their antitrust exemption will require a transition from an association to a union entity from a legal basis perspective. That's what happens in these situations. So that will happen. That will provide them then with the antitrust exemption, and then ultimately they can be decertified, not decertified, et cetera. But the progression on what happens on subsequent CBAs is something that um, will be a good problem for us to have because the initial negotiation will be one that will be on huge seminal gaps that exist in the structure right now. Okay, now, if you don't mind, the UFC right now does not have an antitrust exemption. Um, there's antitrust litigation in the, pro in the process that's about two years in. Is this not going back to square one? No, no, it's not, because the UFC will be desperately want that antitrust exemption at the finalization and the conclusion of the negotiation to create a CBA that governs what happens moving forward over a five- to seven-year period with these athletes. And that will be something... Last question, if you don't mind, sir. But hasn't the FTC already ruled that the UFC is not is not a monopoly? No, they haven't. They haven't. That has been look. And again, this is way way down into the weeds. But having actually been subpoenaed to testify and to give testimony as it related to that monopoly, um, I believe there is an awful lot of evidence to show that they are. And I and just because someone. Um, does not choose from a governmental perspective to pursue an action does not mean that anyone has been identified as not being an egregious predatory monopoly and which I believe the UFC to be. Okay, awesome. Okay, thank you so much. We have one, one last question to get in. Certainly, we'll go finally to uh, Matthew Bull with Arts Voice. Please go ahead. Uh, yeah, hi again, guys. Uh, one last question for you. Thanks again for your time. The uh, most organizations like this that, that do have uh, a board like yourselves uh, appoint a director to run day-to-day -day operations. Is that something that's still on the horizon? Has it already been done? Is the, uh, is the board currently handling day-to-day -day decisions themselves? Uh, if you could speak to that uh, general regard. Thank you. Mr. Kennedy, um, so the, the board is handling the decisions. Um, ultimately, it comes down to us, the fighters. Um, we are, you know, the, the dream is that we're going to be representative of the, the fighters as a whole, you know, the, the men and women that step into the octagon. Um, we're going to have a, a, the best understanding of what their needs are um, from talking to them and, and now having, you know, great strategic advisors like Bjorn. You know, the reason that he's part of this team is he knows the ins and the outs of it. Um, you know, the, the, the reason that people are stepping up to behind us is, and to fund this is because they're, they're brave and they understand that change needs to happen. But we're the ones that are making decisions. The fighters are. We are, we are in control. So um, 
yeah, I wish we would have planted a tree 20 years ago. That's the best time to do it. You know, but the second best time to do it is today, and that's right now. And that's what this is. This is, you know, you guys are part of the step off. This is the starting line. Um, I, we don't have all the answers of what this is going to look like. Um, we just know where we're going and that we're going to be working really, really hard to get there. Um, the, the five people on this call are the ones that are going to be making the decisions moving forward and up to this point. And thank you. All right, thank you so much, and thank you everybody for uh, sticking with the call. We had most of you stay, so we really appreciate it. Um, I'm going to try to organize as best I can. Anybody who wants one-on-ones, just reach out to me, and I'll try to uh, get that expedited as quickly as possible. Uh, but thank you again for joining the call, and have a great day. Thank you. This does conclude today's conference. We appreciate your participation. You may disconnect at any time, and have a great day.